A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. The word of the Lord. St. Paul warns the Romans of his day against conforming themselves to their age. He is speaking here primarily of their minds, their thoughts, as he goes on to exhort them to be transformed by the renewal of their minds. How easy it is to conform our thoughts to the thoughts and ideas and fads of the time and place in which we find ourselves. This happens in overt ways, when we are rationally convinced that X, Y, or Z must be right because the overwhelming majority believe it to be so, and the majority couldn't possibly be completely wrong and off the mark, put it. But it also happens in very subtle and covert ways, in ways that are not that we are not even fully aware of. As our minds are worn down and gradually infected by the barrage of diseased ideas and suggestions that assail us constantly through social media, through the press, through all of the cultural platforms that disseminate the values and ideas of this age. It is a problem ever ancient and ever new. And so St. Paul's exhortation is something that we should take very seriously. Do not conform yourselves to this age. When it comes to ideas about God, which are the most important ideas of all, the predominant ideas of this age can, at least in some way, be summarized well by this notion of moralistic therapeutic deism. As we saw last night, Christian Smith sees this new matrix of religious beliefs to be the dominant de facto religious viewpoint of American young people and of the parents and adults from whom these ideas are absorbed. Smith summarizes the overarching religious ideas of the people he studied and interviewed with this term, moralistic therapeutic deism. Let's take a look at what each of these ideas is really about, and then consider how each of these ideas of the age in which we live gets God wrong in serious ways. Firstly, Smith notes that moralistic therapeutic deism is about inculcating a moralistic approach to life, which means that central to living a good life is being a good moral person. It means being nice, kind, pleasant, respectful, and responsible. It means working on self-improvement, taking care of your health, and doing your best to be successful. Now that doesn't sound so bad. What's wrong with being a kind, pleasant, respectable person? We want to keep in mind that in critiquing the ideas of this age, the evil one, the great deceiver cannot create out of nothing. He cannot create of his own powers. All that the evil one can do 
is take what God has created as good and twist it, distort it, pervert it, such that in all evil, whether in thought or in act, there are aspects of good. And certainly there are things that appear to us to be good. But on the whole, this is a good that has been distorted and corrupted, and therefore it can no longer lead us along the path to that perfect and infinite good that we have been made for. So it's true that being nice and kind and pleasant is all well and good. But consider two questions. Firstly, what is the point of reference here? What is the standard for defining what is good, what is moral? In all of the descriptions of the young people interviewed, there is no reference to God or to an objective moral order that God created in order to guide us to the good. Instead, everything is understood in reference to the self, to whatever I think makes for a good person or a happy, successful person. A moralistic approach necessarily leads to a subjectivistic and relativistic view of the moral life, the good life. Listen to this quote from a young girl from Maryland. I think that religion is important in all respects. You know, if you're Muslim, then Islam is the way for you. If you're Jewish, well, that's great too. If you're Christian, well, good for you. It's just whatever makes you feel good about yourself. When it comes to getting God wrong, there are clearly deep, deep problems with the view of morality that is based solely on a subjective interpretation of good and bad, right and wrong. But there is another, even more important question and critique to consider with regard to the idea of moralism. How does a person actually do this? How does a person become good and kind and successful? A 17-year-old boy from Utah summarizes the answer to this question and the real heart of the problem in these words. I believe in, well, my whole religion is where you try to be good, and uh, if you're not good, then you should just try harder. Just try harder. This is the deepest problem and distortion which lies hidden under this moralistic guise of what looks to be a very respectable program of self-improvement. But this is precisely the problem, that it is solely a program of self-improvement. Me improving myself. Me making myself good. Me perfecting myself. The problem is very simply that this kind of approach can never work. We cannot make ourselves good, at least not perfectly good. No matter how hard we try, no matter how strenuously we exert our wills, this is a dead end. The bottom line here is that we will never get to God and the perfection that He has destined us for by our own power, by our own innate resources, by our own strength of will or our persistent determination. 
Man cannot get to God without God. Notice that this moralistic view of the moral life places all of the emphasis on what I do. It does not even avert to what God does and what I cannot possibly do. This is a heretical perspective that goes back to the earliest centuries of the Church's life. It's called Pelagianism. To believe that I can make myself holy, that I can earn salvation by my good deeds. It's a lie. And it's a deadly lie. And yet, how often in our living of the Christian life is the emphasis placed on what I do? Me making myself good by my deeds. This deeply distorted understanding of the relationship between God and man is corrected by St. Thomas's absolute insistence on the primacy of grace, the priority of God's action above, before man's action. There would be no action of man whatsoever if God was not acting first, moving man by his grace. Aquinas' treatise on grace is a masterpiece, one of the most famous parts of his Summa Theologiae. Without diminishing man's freedom and the need for man's willing cooperation with God's graced action, St. Thomas teaches with profound insight that the moral life is always first and foremost about grace, about what God does in us and for us and to us, and not about what we do for God. This is really a deeply liberating doctrine, because we know, we know deep down that we cannot make ourselves good, that we cannot overcome our deepest vices on our own. There's a story of an Irishman who struggled in a very profound way with anger. He was full of rage, constantly being completely overcome with angry thoughts, angry words, at work, at home, in public, constantly fuming with anger, such that it was destroying the relationships in his life, and things were really at a, at a breaking point. So this man decided that he was no longer going to be angry no matter what. He was going to control his will and never, ever have an outburst of anger again. So much so that he went out and got a tombstone and erected this in his backyard and inscribed on the tombstone, Here lies dead an angry man. And for a few weeks, it worked. He, with all his strength of will, held himself together, never had an outburst of anger, but as he continued to repress the rage within him, these feelings mounted and mounted until finally, one day he had a violent explosion, a volcanic explosion, which was worse than anything that had ever come before. And when he got home, completely depressed by this state of affairs, he saw that the tombstone in the backyard had been knocked down and the ground had been upheaved. He went out to look at the tombstone where he had written, Here lies dead an angry man. And he found the words gone. 
and instead the tombstone said, He is not here. He has risen. The point is simply that we cannot perfect ourselves. No matter how hard or strenuously we seek to exert our will, we can't save ourselves. We can't reach the end of our journey unless God intervenes and changes us, transforms us from within. This is precisely what grace, the primacy of grace, is meant to accomplish in our lives. The grace of God, which always comes before our action, is literally meant to divinize us. To give us a sharing in God's own divine life. Until the day when we are ready to share in that divine life without limit for all eternity. The idea of moralism that Smith identifies in the religious sentiments of so many young people is something that I constantly witness in the religious sentiments of the college students that I teach. This past semester, in a course on the development of Western civilization, we talked about Aquinas' incredibly important idea of the synthesis of faith and reason, how the human person can know God through faith, but also through reason, through the working of the human intellect, and how these things are not opposed to each other, but are meant to work together in synthesis, the mind and the soul, faith and reason. Well, the students had to write an essay on Aquinas' understanding of faith and reason, and one poor girl never understood even what the word reason meant. It became very clear that she had done none of the reading or paid attention in the classes, such that the thesis of the essay that she submitted about Aquinas' teaching on faith and reason was, in order to be saved, you have to have faith in God, and you have to give God a good reason to save you. Now, what this reveals is that Pelagianism and moralism are the default religious position of so many people in our culture. Ideas like this are even thought to be very pious. Religious thoughts, while in fact they are deeply distorted ideas that have a whole lot more to do with the American dream of being able to earn your way and build a rich, lavish life for yourself if you just work hard enough, or the ideals of the Enlightenment the enlightened man, which promises that you can do anything whatsoever, anything that you set your mind to, you can do. Self-actualization without limit. Our minds can be all too easily conformed to these ideas of our age these false and empty promises. If we are going to be transformed by the renewal of our minds, it must begin here, by recognizing that God is the primary actor in the Christian life. God is the protagonist of the story of my life, or better, the story of my small life is contained within the infinitely larger story of God's life. Moralism is all about being caught up in the ego drama of my minuscule existence. 
But true religion is all about being caught up in the Theo drama, in the drama of God's life, the love story of God's divine life, from whence we came and to which we are destined to return by God's action, by His grace, because He is always the first mover, the first cause, the primary actor in the Christian life. Moralism is the first tenet of this new matrix of religious beliefs, and it's closely connected to the second tenet, which is religious religion as therapeutic. In so many ways, we live in a therapeutic culture, a culture of egotistical narcissism, a culture full of industries aimed entirely at making me feel good about myself, a culture wherein sin has been displaced by sickness and morality by psychology. A therapeutic culture is a culture of misconstrued self-fulfillment, which in the end can only lead to self-destruction. When these ideas of our age are applied to religion, a relationship with God becomes principally about receiving therapeutic benefits. As Christian Smith found with the young people he interviewed, religion is no longer about repentance from sin, or keeping holy the Sabbath, or building character through virtue, or giving oneself in charity and generosity to others. No, religion instead is about feeling good, feeling happy, secure, and at peace. It's about attaining subjective well-being. As Smith notes, it's no wonder that so many religious and non-religious teenagers are so positive about religion, because the faith that many of them have in mind effectively helps them to achieve a primary life goal, to feel good and happy about oneself and one's life. It is also no wonder, he says, that most teens are so religiously inarticulate. As long as one is happy, why bother with being able to talk about the content of one's beliefs? We can see here, very obviously, the recurrence of an exclusively subjective emphasis. God exists for my sake, to make me happy, of course, according to my definition of happiness. We make our requests known to Him, we expect Him to do His part, and provide what we ask for, and we reserve the right to hold him in contempt if he does not provide the benefits that we rightly deserve. Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen, in writing about this kind of approach to life and faith, speaks of this as a desire for the power of God without the sacrifice of God. A desire for miracles without the cross. A desire for success without faithfulness. In the end, this is a desire to have it our way rather than God's way, and even more so, 
to believe that our way is better than God's way. To be transformed by the renewal of our minds means to continually come back to the words of God spoken through the prophet Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. We are children who do not know what is best, absolutely best for ourselves, who cannot see what the Father can see, who cannot begin to fathom and understand the providential plan of God for our lives and for our ultimate good. One of the biggest problems then with a therapeutic mindset is the tendency to diagnose ourselves and to then prescribe for ourselves what we think will cure our ills. This is deeply problematic because we will always fail to some degree in assessing the deepest problems of our lives correctly and thus in seeing the true solution to these problems precisely because our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Our ways are not His ways. What God reveals to us as the greatest problem of our lives is sin. And the only cure for this problem is Jesus Christ. There is no greater problem for mankind, and there can be no other solution to the problem of our lives. When we lose sight of this, we lose Christianity itself, and we are left with yet another self-help program that seeks to cover over and bandage our wounds without ever healing them, and to anesthetize us into a dull, diminished existence, rather than to take the pain of our souls seriously, and to let that pain and suffering lead us to the Divine Physician, who alone can heal us. A relationship with the Living God is not about therapy. It is about transformation. The transformation that comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. It is about God's solution to man's greatest problem, rather than man's misconstrued project of self-fulfillment, which will never lead to beatitude, to perfect, unending happiness, because our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Our ways are not His ways. God's way to truth and life is Jesus Christ. Those who die with Him will rise with Him, will rise to a life transformed and perfected by the saving grace of God. This brings us then to the last pillar of this dominant de facto religious ideology of moralistic therapeutic deism, a deistic conception of God. Deism 
is originally an 18th century school of thought which proposes belief in a God who exists, who created the world, and who defines the general moral order, but who is in no way personally involved in the affairs of creation, and specifically of human life. The image often associated with this conception is God as a clockmaker. God fashions the clock, he puts everything precisely in place, and he gets it all going, but then the clock runs on its own, with no need for further intervention from its maker. The young people that Smith interviewed often spoke of God as watching over everything from above. As one of them said, God just monitors everything. He sits back and watches like he's watching a play. Often, the underlying motivation behind a conception of God as one who is not personally involved in human affairs is that God, therefore, cannot be involved in those parts of my life that I don't want him to have anything to do with. I can keep him at a safe distance in order to protect my own interests. This classical idea of deism is modified, however, by modern adherents of moralistic therapeutic deism, because while modern people do not want God involved in some very particular areas of their lives, there are other ways in which they do want God to be involved, namely to provide the therapeutic benefits that they expect of him. And so deism in this matrix of religious ideas is qualified by the therapeutic aspect, such that God only gets involved in my life when I call upon him, when I need him, when I want him. Otherwise, he minds his own business and he stays out of my business. Christian Smith summarizes all of these ideas about the God of moralistic therapeutic deism in this way. God is something like the combination of a div divine butler and a cosmic therapist. A divine butler and a cosmic therapist. He is always on call. He takes care of any problems that arise. He gives professional help to those who need it so that they might feel better about themselves, and he doesn't become too personally involved in the process. A divine butler and a cosmic therapist. Is this the God of Christian revelation? It's true that God is creator and designer and lawgiver. But it is also true that God has revealed himself to be a Trinitarian communion who seeks to draw us into his own divine life in the most personal and intimate way possible. It's true that God speaks to his people through the scriptures to teach them how to live in right relationship with himself. It's true that this relationship with God takes on unprecedented personal and intimate dimensions in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who becomes man so that man might become God. And it is true that the Spirit of God is sent into our hearts to bring to perfection the work of redemption that Christ has won for us. This is the God of Christianity. 
And it is a far, far cry from the god of moralistic therapeutic deism, which in the end is nothing more than a false god, or as Freud would have it, a projection of the god invented by man in order to fulfill his own needs. And we could add his own deeply misunderstood and misconstrued needs. We can see a logical connection here between the therapeutic element of this belief system and this deistic conception of God which follows from it. Because the therapeutic element denies or at least fails to understand what man's real problem is, namely sin. The deistic conception of God fails to understand God's solution to our problem, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the paschal mystery of his suffering and death and resurrection, God becoming man in order to save man from himself. It is only when we understand the full scope of our problem as sinful, fallen persons who in justice are absolutely deprived of the glory of God. It is only then that we begin to see the need for a solution that goes far, far beyond what we can construe for ourselves. A deistic conception of God, which suppresses the good news of the Incarnation, does not believe in a God who has become personally present to us. Such a conception is, in fact, what conduces humanity to dysfunctional and dangerous totalitarianism. The source of the greatest suffering throughout human history is the attempt to deal with original sin on our own through our political, economic, military, and cultural efforts. When we try to eliminate conflict and sin through social reform, we inevitably make matters worse. The key to happiness for the individual and for the whole human community is the conviction that God has dealt with the problem of original sin, that God has taken sin upon himself, that he has suffered with us and for us so as to present a solution that we could never attain for ourselves. God has intervened. He has presented the greatest solution to the deepest and most tragic human problem. But sinful, foolish man is all too easily beguiled into believing that it is better to keep God at a safe distance because he doesn't have our best interests entirely in mind. After all, we know what is truly best for ourselves, or at least what is best in this moment, and we don't want anything to interfere with that. After years and years and years of keeping God at bay, St. Augustine finally came to see the full truth and beauty as he cries out in these words in his confessions, Late have I loved you, O beauty so ancient, O beauty so new, late have I loved you. 
Behold, you were within me, and I was outside. It was there that I sought you. Deformed as I was, I ran after those beauteous things that you have made. You were with me, but I was not with you. For those things kept me far from you, which, unless they existed in you, would have no being. You have called, you have cried and pierced my deafness. You have poured forth your light. You have shown forth and dispelled my blindness. You have sent forth your fragrance, fragrance, and I have inhaled and panted after you. I have tasted you, and I hunger and thirst for you. You have touched me, and I am inflamed with the desire for your peace. Augustine realized the truth that God is nearer to us than we are to ourselves. He is within. It is we, at times, who are without, wandering, looking for God in all the wrong places. And yet, we seek to banish the God who is within to the highest heavens as an exile from his creation, as one who can have nothing to do with human life, or at least certain parts of my life. But Augustine realizes even more importantly that the God who is ever present to us, within us even when we are without, is also the God who loves us and who alone is able to satiate the infinite desires of the human heart. God is not our enemy or our jailkeeper, nor is he our butler or our therapist. He is our happiness and our peace. He is the answer to the problem of every human life. The Christian is the one who knows the truth of who God is and who sees the radical surrender that the Christian life demands as the free and willing surrender of the beloved into the hands of her lover. Tragically, the deistic impulse to protect ourselves from God and to keep him at bay is only a recipe for self-alienation and for endless inner conflict and misery. Because as St. Augustine teaches us, the one who made us made us for himself. And therefore, our hearts will always be restless until they rest in him. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may know what is the will of God, what is good and perfect and pleasing. The will of God is for man to share in God's own divine life. Man, instead, foolishly, tries to hold on to his own fallen human life at all costs because of his false, confused, distorted ideas, because man cannot begin to fathom what God has in store for those who love him. We see this problem writ large with all of the ideas that make up the revisionist faith of moralistic therapeutic deism. But the problem of getting God wrong, which remains a lively problem for each of us, 
in the end can be reduced to one fundamental overarching problem. All of moralistic therapeutic deism can be reduced to this. The problem of placing myself at the center of all things and seeing God and religion and every aspect of human life from the sole perspective of my mind, of how it relates to me, to my needs, to my thoughts, to my life. Moralistic therapeutic deism is ultimately about the worship of a false god, and that false god is none other than myself. As with all sin and distortion, all of this can be reduced to the capital sin of pride, the first sin, the greatest sin, the root of all sin, the sin of placing myself at the center, of making myself the arbiter of reality, even of God's own life, in order to serve my own misconstrued ideas of self-fulfillment. In the Old Testament, idolatry is portrayed as the most grave of all sins. You shall have no other gods before me, we hear in the first commandment of the law. The temptation of idolatry remains a lively one for each of us in large ways, but especially in very subtle, nuanced ways. Like the people of Israel of old, we too can be stalled in the desert or even lose our way completely because our minds have been infested with false and distorted ideas. And thus our hearts have been given over to the worship of a false God. But the God who saved his chosen people in times past continues to lead us, his children, to the solution, the one and only solution to the greatest human problem, the solution that is Jesus Christ, here, present before us in his own body, blood, soul, and divinity. We have seen that getting God wrong inevitably leads to false, idolatrous worship. But we will see tomorrow that true worship will always lead us to getting God right to being firmly grounded in the truth of who God is, so that we might love in charity the one that we have come to know in truth.